Ward and Al show on Sirius XM. And we will moderate this panel for you. Are you guys ready to get it started? Okay, as the panel goes on, we will be uh, taking some questions from the audience for the cast and scream. So what you want to do is find Stefano and line up behind him. Stefano will come out and uh, raise his hand and everyone will know what he there looks he like. Is. There he is. Oh, isn't he cute? Look at him. Look at him. All He's right. the man you want to find when you have a question. All right, let's get these stars out here. All right, let's bring out the stars of Scream. Can you believe it? It's been almost 20 years. Please welcome to the stage, Nell Campbell. guest for you. I, is he here? I think he, I think he must be here. Can we, can we hear him? <laughs> <laughs> this plan's really working out. <laughs> Do you like scary movies, everyone? <laughs> years later. Can it's you believe like it? It's a weird reunion show. It's a reunion. Now, if I'm going to jump in with you right away, after you first made this movie, how long did it take you to start dating again? <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> um, I, I, didn't, I, I was able to separate the two. Were you? Because yeah. I'm not kidding, I just rewatched Scream and I was like, I would never date again. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> she wouldn't go out with me, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, you were you Although know, I dated Matt Lillard right after that, so that's weird. <laughs> this was a risky movie to make. People don't realize that now because of the legacy it has. But did you think 19 years ago, getting ready to make this film, that you'd be here today, that it would have the longevity and the lasting fan base that it has still? I don't know if you can ever know that. I think, you know, you can have a sense that something is good and, and hope that people will enjoy it, but I don't think you can ever have the concept of something being this huge. I'm like hearing this big reverb. Are you hearing that? Yeah. Creeping people out? Yes, <laughs> 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 Like a reverb. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, we do have to mention, and we should probably just mention it right away, is that Wes Craven, of course, directed all of the screen movies, and uh, yeah, amazing director. Amazing director. Unfortunately, passed away last week. Do you guys have any memories of him from the set or from making the movie that you want to share? Or a million? Uh, <laughs> um, it's a hard one. He was just a phenomenal, phenomenal man. He was just an astounding director, so astute and excited. He was always elated to be working and grateful to be working and loved his job. And, um, and I, I don't know, I wrote about this the other day, but he, his energy and his passion for what he did really um, got passed down to the crew. I really think that a director sets the tone for a shoot, uh, whether it's gonna be a positive experience or a negative experience or, um, and everybody down to every single crew member, every cast member, we all had a blast and we all really appreciated and were grateful for what we were doing and that's down to West. And what an amazing man he was. I'm gonna say that. Yeah, he was incredible. I worked with him on a different film many years after Scream and it was, he had, he was, 
the same creative force he had always been. Um, he had mellowed a little bit, you know, but he was still vibrant in his creative energy. And, um, you know, he's a brilliantly smart man um, and always approached certainly the stuff I was doing in Scream from a psychological perspective. And it was never about results, it was about connection. And, and uh, he, he's definitely missed. Well, I remember from the, the first night of filming that uh, Drew Barrymore had to pull a lot out of herself to really get the reaction she needed for that scene. And I noticed that when he would call cut, the moment he called cut, Wes was by her side with his hand on her shoulder because she was really drawing on some things for herself deep within to get that level of disturbance, that level of manic upsetness, the fear. He was very kind. He was always considered. He looked out for everyone. And I think it's amazing and a kind of a testament to him also that this is one of the few franchises where, you know, the majority of the cast, the ones that lived, uh, <laughs> stayed with the franchise and he directed the whole franchise, which is pretty special. We were all really passionate about him being a part of all of the projects. You know, every time they came back to us about the sequel from me, it was always as long as Wes is doing it. And I think everybody felt that way. Who carried on. <laughs> and I think a lot of people don't realize that you're talking about a man that continually reinvented the horror genre. Not once, not twice, but three times. And you guys were part of that hat trick. You know, was, was there a sense of that when you were making this? Or in some ways did you think, I'm making a horror movie? No, I think, we, especially with Kevin's script and the, and the two of them as a team, we definitely knew that there was something. I mean, the film looked at the genre itself, so we were we were aware that it wasn't just solely a horror film. That you know, it was uh, slightly more intelligent than just that. I always no looked at it as, as like it was a documentary about two real serial killers, and <laughs> um, for whatever twisted reason, and um, and it didn't. I don't think. You know, Nev and I had done the craft together prior to that, and we were on screen when it came out, and could, we never really, I think, or certainly I didn't expect, didn't think sort of what she was saying earlier about the future of it. You know, you lived in the moment of making it and trying to do the best you could do to live up to the story, and it's unbelievable what it's done, and to see you know, my kids are 14 now, and a lot of their generation are fans of the movie as well. To, so to see it span generations speaks to its own truth, and its truth in the humor, and its truth in the, the disgusting behaviors, and you know, all of it. It, it really transcends uh, through the years. It's holding up. Well, and, oh, sorry, Roger, you can say something? I was just going to say that. I certainly had no idea what was going on because I didn't even know what was going on in the movie. <laughs> I never saw anything but the scenes I was in, so I had no idea what was happening with any of the other characters or what was going on in the plot of the rest of the film. I only dealt with the scenes that I was in, so I just played the scene. So you later must have looped the lines that I was speaking through the voice box in the kitchen scene, right? Yes. <laughs> That <laughs> that's, that, oh, sorry. that's fascinating because your voice performance is so incredible in it and sets so much of the tone. Did you write it? Did you So did you, how did you find that voice? I mean, yeah. Um, <laughs> Solid Again, um, at the audition, the audition was the first scene, the opening scene of the first film. And um, I read the script, which was brilliant. It was all right there. I just did what you do as an actor. You study the scene and you give it what you think it needs. And it's obvious. The whole thing is about cat and mouse. He's got to 
slowly bring her in. He's got to be interesting enough to keep her interested and keep her on the phone, on the phone. Keep her coming back and maybe a little sexy because of course sex is going to sell everything. <laughs> <laughs> and just keep her playing with him. Oh, you're going to make popcorn. I only make popcorn when I'm going to watch a movie. <laughs> um, you like scary movies? What's your favorite scary movie? <laughs> first time. Some people have never seen the voice of the ghost based killer mm -hmm. before now. I've seen the face behind the voice. How, how, long, <laughs> how long was it before you guys got to see Roger? Because you didn't get to see him on set. We met three weeks ago. Same. <laughs> <laughs> really? Really? Yeah. Wow. Wes, it was really important to Wes that we not meet Roger. Um, he thought it would be easier for us to have the fear and the apprehension if we were less familiar with the actor. Um, he was right. <laughs> so, yes, hi, Roger. <laughs> I just it's thought so his weird to see you sitting here and then that weird ghost face guy out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because I remember on the first, well, we had no idea what you did, but I remember at some point us sitting around, we'd had some wine, we're like, do you think, do you think it would be good enough that maybe there'd be a Halloween costume? <laughs> like, like, no. You don't think so. <laughs> no. And then you get this. Stuff all the time. <laughs> it's pretty cool. We, we and it comes with a lot of go-karts too. We did. We rode go-karts in Santa Rosa, California. <laughs> so, to be part of such a horror franchise, what does it feel like to be parodied? Because, of course, Scary Movie was the original title of the screen, which went on to be a parody series. What did it feel like to see yourself parodied on screen? I've actually only seen the first 40 minutes of it. <laughs> it's not because I was offended in any way. I just, I don't know why, I don't, I can't remember if I was on an airplane and the plane landed and then I just stopped and then I just didn't go back to it. But it was funny. I thought it was good. And, you know, there's, what's the adage? Um, what is it? You gotta go with that, I think. Um, it's so, you know, you guys, now you ended up living with this character for a long time. Um, was that hard as it went on? What, did you feel like you kept having to find new things in Sydney? Or did you just get comfortable with it, it felt like a friend? It felt like a really damaged friend. <laughs> um, no, I was comfortable with it. I think I knew the character and I think we kept true to where she would be at at different periods in her life. And um, I think the writing was always very good. So, and Wes was always good at keeping me on track. So, um, I didn't really struggle with it. I enjoyed revisiting her. And Skeet, how did you feel about Billy? Because you had a challenging role. We had to suspect you and then be like, no, he would never do that to her. And then be like, he did it. <laughs> That's a lot of different things to make people feel, though, in one role, right? Uh, yeah, it was definitely a challenge. I mean, I, th I think part of the beginning of it, you know, you wanted it to be, or I wanted it to be kind of too obvious that it would be him. So that, you know, the audience would be like, oh, it's gotta be him, but no, wait, that's too easy, it's too early. They wouldn't spo spoil it that early. Um, but it was it was a challenge, for sure. I mean, there was a lot of, I, I, the hotel we stayed in, I had two rooms, um, and they were connected, so I turned one of them into Billy's room, and the other one I slept in, and Billy's room was like, I mean, I was 25 or 26 playing this high school kid, and. So I turned one room, it was posters everywhere and black lights and, you know, it was crazy music and, um, and that's where I would go before I'd go to set and hang out in there and get to live in that mindset for a little bit and then I'd 
come back usually in the morning because it was all a lot of night shoots um, and crash in my sleeping room where the I can't even imagine what the maids thought because <laughs> the sheets you know even if you showered like the, all the blood Covered on the blood. skin was like you know it just would white sheets were pink by the morning. <laughs> you should have just said it was Matthew Lillard's room. <laughs> he probably went through the same thing. But I mean, it was, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a tough part, but so much fun. Um, especially when he finally reveals himself at the end to, to get to fully go crazy. And there was a lot of stuff they had to cut out of the kitchen scene that it had an NC-17 rating um, when they first showed it to the ratings board and so he had to lose a little bit of stuff to get the rating where they wanted it. Did, did you guys know about that at the time? Because while the shoot was going on, there were actually a lot of troubles between Wes Craven and the studio and the MPAA, you know, a lot of cuts, he had to go back several times. At one point he was afraid of getting fired by the studio and had to and put together a rough board. cut. And the school board, all the locations they had scouted, that they read the script and were like, "No, you're not shooting this here." And then they had to find other locations, and it was a, it was a lot. Were you aware of all that while it was going on, or were you guys just shooting the movie? We were aware of some of it, certain things, like um, after they had shot the scene with Drew and her guts are hanging out. I remember Wes having a, letting us know that there was some discrepancy on whether the guts should be steaming or not. <laughs> and if they got steamed, that was an NC-17, and if they didn't steam, then it was something else. <laughs> Which is ridiculous, but that's how the rules go. That is so weird. No, wait, Roger, if you didn't see any of the actors, how, were you on set? Like, how did they not see you? How did you voice? Uh, I was off to the side. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, well, the first night I was actually outside the window under a small canopy, a very small <laughs> And uh, it was raining. Like, normal rain doesn't photograph. If you see rain in films, it's usually special effects because they have to be very big drops. So next time you watch Scream, when you look at Drew's boyfriend take to the chair, you'll notice he's dripping. So I was standing out there in the rain, looking at her through the window like this. <laughs> I'm more of a game, really. Can you handle that? And then on the second night, they set up a room in the garage and uh, ran a monitor in so I was watching the camera feed. So from then on, I was always off in a room somewhere nearby with the cell phone hooked up to their cell phone, connected, and I'm watching the camera feed so I could see them and they couldn't see me. Yeah, that adds a horrifying layer to that. Did you guys know? Uh, I'm feeling a little creepy right now. <laughs> Did you guys know he was on set in a little room watching you? Like, that's... I didn't know where he was. I knew he was somewhere, obviously. Yeah. Um, but no, I, wasn't, I was never aware of where he was in the room. Roger, did you ever have the urge to talk to them in your Mojo Jojo voice from Powerpuff Girls? There was no Mojo at that time. <laughs> the chemical X had not been spilled as yet. That would have been interesting. <laughs> It's more of a game, really. Can you handle that, honey? <laughs> this doesn't work, does it? It's such a good party trick, isn't it? <laughs> they can never be boring at a dinner party. Okay, so Steve, can you give us your best Ghostface Killer impression as if you were the one talking on the phone? Since technically it was supposed to be you. <laughs> Just say no. Time. Yeah, no, really. Just say no. Um, what was the line? Uh, what's the matter, Sydney? You look like you've seen a ghost. Ooh. And I think, I think, Nev, since you never got to be the killer on the phone, you should do it now, too. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I'll pass on that. <laughs>
We've got uh, we've got a pretty sweet lineup going over there. Let's uh, throw to some fan questions. Hey guys, um, first of all, I'm a massive Wes Craven fan. He's responsible for two of my favorite horror franchises of all time, including Scream. Uh, my question is for Miss Campbell. You mentioned earlier you said you know not without Wes. So is this the end of Sidney Prescott? If they make a Scream Five, would you ever return without Wes? That is such a tough question. Um, I've, honestly, it's so new. I have no idea right now. Um, I'm not sure they would do another one anyway. They're doing a series at the moment. I'm not sure it would make sense to then do another film. Um, and honestly, I want to call Wes and ask him what he thinks, and I can't, so I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> All right, speaking of the series, are any of you involved with the series? No, no. It's I haven't seen it yet, either. Yeah. Um, and I will. I have a three-year-old, so it's kind of hard to turn that on in my household. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, I will see it. I hear it. I, I know people are enjoying it. Skeet, what about a Billy prequel? Would you be on board? Hmm. I, I think I'd be a little old to play the Billy prequel. <laughs> no, we do Wet Hot American Summer style. We just uh, <laughs> go back. <laughs> Got another one? Hi there. Uh, we all know the basic three rules to successfully surviving a horror movie. No sex, no <laughs> drinking and drugs, and never, ever say, I'll be right back. Is, back. <laughs> is there anything that any of you would add to that list? Like how to survive a horror movie, or how to survive acting in a horror movie? <laughs> what a charming radio voice you have. <laughs> I've been told. Uh, lots of painkillers. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I think there was a lot of Advil going around the set with all the stunts. Um, I remember we were, we would joke like, "What is Nat doing today? Is she screaming, crying, or crying. running? <laughs> <laughs> or screams. all? Or all? All of the above? I would do something. Turn on the damn lights! Don't go into that dark room. Don't go down the basement. Turn on the lights! <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Um, you guys were mentioning a little bit earlier about how uh, authentic fear you guys had by not meeting the actor. I was wondering if there was anything else that was put in authentically. In previous horror movies, they have it where the actors don't know what's happening, and so their reactions are genuine. I was wondering if you guys had anything like that. I mean, I think he's the perfect example of, you know, a little bit of that. Um, Asking if we know of other films where that's happened? Uh, no, in your, in your film, was there any moments where it was just authentic? You just weren't expecting it. Yeah, when you hit me in the chest <laughs> with the umbrella. <laughs> oh, you're that. It was like a, a, a pad right here. I've missed. had open heart surgery, so I was like protective of my chest. <laughs> she missed. <laughs> Oops. Oops. <laughs> um, no, that, other, otherwise, actually, because you have to be really specific during the stunts, and you want to be careful and not do things like that. Um, no, there weren't, there weren't really surprises when I came to those kinds of scenes. And the gentleman in the white mask. Question <laughs> so uh, for all three. <laughs> What's your favorite scary movie? <laughs> Changeling. Oh, George oh. That was the first time I ever saw. I was 13 and I had a nightmare for months, and it's pretty brilliant if you haven't seen it. Mine's Scream. <laughs> right answer. <laughs> uh, I think The Exorcist or The Exorcism of Emily Rose, those are terrifying to me. I tried to watch The Exorcism of Emily Rose at my house, which is kind of hidden behind redwood trees and very, it got very creepy very quick. And uh, I couldn't watch it until the next morning. <laughs> I have so many horror movies I love, but one I'm gonna mention in particular is The Howling. Yeah. Because I love Joe Dante, and it was the great Robert Picardo is here, who played Eddie, the sort of Charles Manson werewolf cult leader. 
He was so good in that. God, oh, it's just amazing. <laughs> One the, I like eating meat. <laughs> One of the things that makes Scream so endearing and enduring is uh, the fact that it has a sense of humor along with the horror. I mean, it is truly a scary movie, but at times it's very satirical, very funny, very smart like that. Uh, what was it like doing that switching back and forth between horror and satire? I, you know, I, for some reason I never really noticed it until, like, <laughs> Matt would speak. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, but I, I mean, in my mind, like, my part was, like, straightforward, like, everything was engineered towards plotting this, you know, this, laying out this plan this guy had, and, and then <laughs> Matt would speak up, and I was like, what, I, Wes, why is it so? I mean, why why is he acting so funny? Like, you know, like, that's, serious. That's, like, that's Wes's brilliance. Though, yeah, he casts certain very specific kinds of actors to to bring out things in the film, to bring out the satire, and then people like you and I to bring out the drama. I think. Yeah. But we couldn't yeah. have stepped into that. That you thing. We wouldn't have been, we would have been engaged lot. with the characters. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was sort. It was really, I guess, Jamie and Matt, yeah. and um, but ours was pretty. Pretty straightforward, and you know, I mean, uh, you know, we also had romance to like play at points. So there were, I mean, I guess there was some funny stuff there, but acting out teens with hormones, is, there's nothing very funny about it. <laughs> That's a little embarrassing. <laughs> I, I actually can we do like a cross, um, a movie cross? Minute, Roger, can you in the in the Ghostface voice? Say, um, did you check the children? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's a good one, right? It's one of the scariest movie lines ever, and I'd love to hear it in that voice. Yeah. Cover your ears. Yeah. <laughs> love this one. Did you check the children? <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> it's wonderful, but awful. It's coming from inside the house. <laughs> Take off your cell phones. <laughs> so who's more rabid? Fans of Scream or fans of the craft? Mm. Mm. I, I, I don't know. It seems like um, the people who are committed to Scream are really committed to Scream and vice versa. You know, I think people have a great love for one or the other. Um, I think, I'm not sure. That's a good question. Yeah, I'm not, I don't know. I, it seems to me that the Scream fans are, in a way, but I, but I haven't... You know, we haven't, well, I guess we had the craft panel at the last one, and they were pretty... Yeah, very so, enthusiastic as well. Yeah. I went to, uh, they, in, in Hollywood, the Hollywood Cemetery, they show movies um, in the summertime. And they had, because it's the craft reunion, 20 years, right? Yeah. Um, they, showed, they showed the craft in the cemetery at night, and Robin and Rachel True and I went. And it was hilarious because all of these, you know, adults, proper adults, because we've all grown up with them now, <laughs> wearing the Bonnie costume, or wearing all, wearing all the outfits, and enjoying the film. And I, I, I haven't really realized how excited people were about that. You know, forty-year-olds walking around doing spells. <laughs> 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 uh, but, <you> know. <laughs> I was uh, like an angsty sixteen or seventeen-year-old when that movie came out, and yeah, like you guys were my inspiration for the way I dressed and lived my life at that time. And again, no. <laughs> Let's uh, keep the questions coming. Uh, hi, I just wanted to say Scream is by far my favorite horror franchise. Um, and my question is, were there ever any times on set where the cast tried to prank each other or scare each other? <laughs> I, don't, I mean, I don't remember any straight up pranks, but I remember coming in um, at one point in the, to do part of the kitchen scene, and it was, and Courtney was coming in, like right behind me, and Wes was standing there, and, and I just sort of looked at her with this, you know, sort of testing out the feeling of the scene, and she, froze and 
And Wes was like, stop it, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> and, but she was genuinely terrified, like, for a moment. Um, but I don't remember any particular pranks, necessarily. There were a few times on the, I think, the second and third film where, you know, I'd be going, I'd be in a scene and I'm going to run towards something and they'd have a ghost face jump out the other side and just, just get me. So there were a few, there were a few of those. Or the prop guy would get in costume too and suddenly there'd be two ghost faces running out. <laughs> a few moments like that. Hi, um, I had not seen Scream actually until like two days ago because I saw, yeah, I saw this panel was happening and I was like, oh, I should probably check that out. Because I had heard good things about it. And the first horror movie and franchise I had gotten into was Wes Craven's uh, A Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, and I love those and I love Freddy. And I was like, yeah, I might as well check it out. So I was watching it uh, on Netflix, because I have uh, the first three with a buddy of mine. And when it was done, we were like, that was consi considering, you know, mo most of the time horror movies are like, you know, a supernatural kind of thing, like a ghost or a spirit or something. It was kind of a nice change to have it just be a dude and his buddy. <laughs> Like, yeah, it was just kind of a cool change, and it was kind of cool to see, kind of compare the first Nightmare on Elm Street to Scream and see what they had in common. And I didn't know Scream was Wes's either at first, because I was just like, oh, hey, what's that? Let's we'll check it out. And I did, and then it's like, oh man, he was in that too? <laughs> cool. Good question. But <laughs> But then I was like, ah, I'd just rather say hi. <laughs> <laughs> it is a good point though, because I I love it. I hate it in a horror movie sometimes when like sinister the opening was great, and then in the middle I was like, if this is a demon, I'm gonna be mad, and it was. And so it is kind of nice sometimes when it's like. <laughs> Oh, you've oh, seen it. <laughs> okay, well, there's an interesting thing. Um, what, what he was kind of touching on with Supernatural or whatever, you guys have, you know, you're probably some of the last people to make a horror movie where it's not all about the digital effects, right? Just in, as your careers have evolved, I mean, in the last Scream movie, in Scream 4, uh, there were digital effects. Was it, was it different going from all practical to suddenly having to act opposite you know, CGI. I'm actually trying to remember what moment was CGI. <laughs> yeah. No, honestly. Do you know? Uh, there was some, uh, you got the knife in the face, knife in the head, and it wasn't oh. really there. Oh. And a lot of the blood is CGI now, as opposed oh, right. to practical. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that wouldn't be any good because I wouldn't see it, but we still were using the, the blood as well. So that would probably just be to add blood. So I didn't, no, I didn't really notice a difference because it wasn't, it wasn't like in the craft where you're using green screen for flying and that kind of thing. Um, I like that. It's kind of like with Star Wars, with Yoda and all that. I really liked the original. Something, I don't know, something was lost to me when they brought in all the CGI. So I, kinda, I, I do appreciate it all when it doesn't have too much of that. And you're just, you're basing it on the actors and the director's talent. Mm -hmm. I assumed for a long time that the voice, like, was a voice box for ages. And then I realized, that that's just a creepy person. <laughs> <laughs> then I realized the man of a thousand voices existed. <laughs> you you have pretty much voiced like everything, right? Not quite everything, Dottie. <laughs> Do you have a preference? Do you like doing, I mean, you've done video games, you've done TV, you've done movies. Is there anything you have a preference to do when it comes to voice acting? Just the next job. <laughs> Keep working. It's, I just love doing, doing what I do, doing the work. And, and the two of you, you both on TV, you both on film, now you're joining House of Cards yes. next season. Yes. Yes. Because 
TV seems to be the place to be for some of the actors. I mean, did you think it would be that way 20 years ago, that everyone would be moving to television? Well, it's interesting because there used to be such an attitude about if you were a film actor moving into television. And I actually remember um, during Party of Five and when I did Scream, they used me doing Scream in Party of Five as an example of it is okay to cross over. I remember they did it and it was either Rolling Stone or Time Magazine or something and they used it as an example. Because at that time it really, there was a divide and, and you shouldn't have been able to cross over. And now, I mean, a lot of us are feeling the better writer, writing is in television. It's so difficult to get films made now when quality films. It's either big studio picks or, you know, tiny, tiny budgets, and it's hard to get those financed nowadays. So really, the work is in TV, if you can get a good show, you know. Um, so I'm really glad that you can bounce back and forth, and that there is, and there's so many platforms now, which is amazing um, for television. So things have certainly shifted. And there's such a, a renaissance in horror in television now that it's amazing. I mean, American Horror Story just gets better every season. Yeah, the Walking Dead, when I first heard about The Walking Dead before I read the, the books, I thought, what are they, how, what are they gonna do with this? What are they, the bite of the week? <laughs> see the show? And it's not about zombies, it's about people and how people work together to survive in difficult situations. It's all character. Mm -hmm. It's all character. It's <laughs> a very directionally sensitive one. Nothing over here. You gotta be like her. <laughs> and the, the influx of comedy and horror. I love The Walking Dead, and I love Z Nation. Yeah. 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 Funny. <laughs> Zombie, zombie tornado. Okay. <laughs> zombie baby. Yeah, yeah. Really, really. yeah. You're the best. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hello. Uh, I first should start by saying that I'm a huge fan of the huge whole Spring series. I think I watched the original when I was like 16. <laughs> so um, my um, question involves like uh, in, in the sequels, it was a big deal trying to hide who the killer was. So I was wondering when the cast knew the identity of the killer during the film of the first film. They started um, being really nervous about scripts getting out. Um, so they, I think it was either the second or the third, they stopped telling all of the cast members who the killer was. I, or for some reason, I always knew. Um, and I'm not sure why that, cho that choice, but um, yeah, they, they stopped. It was really only the person who was playing the killer who knew, and I knew, and obviously Wes people, the higher-ups knew, but um, otherwise they kept it secret because they didn't want it to get leaked. What about the kills? Were those a secret as well at some point, or did you just know everyone was going to die? That's just... <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think we knew everyone was going to die. I mean, we had the majority of the script. I think the people who knew they were dying. And, um, but yeah, it got really complicated. All the scripts had these deep red lines through them so that they couldn't be printed and, and put on the internet. And, um, and I remember they even, even put out some false scenes and false scripts to try and divert audiences from trying to guess what was going on. So, yeah. uh, I think they did a pretty good job, though. It was so important. You don't want to know, do you? Really. I mean, I don't want to know the ending of a film or a book before I'm in the experience. It is an interesting aspect to television and film now that yet yeah, you, have, you almost have to do counter espionage. And, and leak the fake scripts, and do, because so much stuff does get out there. And yeah, it's always better to be surprised. But I'm, the, I'm, I'm that exact person that's like, I should wait, but I'll just Google it. <laughs> Steve, were you ever afraid of being typecast as a villain? Uh, no, not at all. And, and I mean, I don't think he was a villain. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was a victim. <laughs> <laughs> to the other. Um, no, I, not at all. I, and I didn't, I don't, I mean, aside from maybe like the CSI in New York I did a few episodes of, I don't think I've played another killer, if I remember correctly. So I wasn't, wasn't worried at all. In fact, I, the movie I did literally between the craft and scream, uh, called Touch. Uh, the, 
I left that set where I was the second coming of Christ in modern day LA. <laughs> and then a few days later, I was Billy Loomis. And um, so I wasn't, I, to me, it was fun to get to play the bad guy. And, and yet, I didn't really necessarily worry that that was going to be my career. Because I had a bunch of other stuff I did anyway. Question for all of you. Do you guys have a preference of the kind of character you play? Do you like being the villain or the hero? Or is it whatever character it is you just want to play it? I think just as long as it's three dimensional, you know, as long as it's well thought out and there are interesting <laughs> aspects to the character to me. It doesn't matter whether they're good or evil, as long as they're somehow, I don't know, um, based in reality or human nature or you know, aspects of people. Yeah, I have no preference. Um, I, I think, you know, a character that speaks to you and, and, and it can be in many different ways, but that, you know, something that you find intriguing and challenging and, uh, and can, like I've said, that it's fully rounded and has, a, has an interesting uh, perspective and piece of the story is always, you know, whenever I always find if I can't stop thinking about that story, I have to do it. It doesn't matter if it's good, bad, or whatever. Yeah, so the variety that's interesting. And it's a pleasure to work with good writing. And if you don't have good writing, it's a pleasure to try and exercise your craft and bring your best to it and make it as good as you can make it. Go ahead. Hi there, uh, this question is for Nev. i um, asking on behalf of AfterIsland.com. So it's been um, just over 15 years since Wild Things, and uh, you just mentioned the Scream series, and, and there's, a, there's a queer character on there. So I just wanted to ask if you would uh, play queer again, and if you would, would you do it uh, on a horror series or a horror movie? I think I've played homosexual or bisexual about five times already in my career, so I obviously don't have an issue around it. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, in the same way of talking about playing, uh, you know, a hero or a villain, it's, it's just as long as the character is well-rounded and comes from truth and is something that someone out there will be able to relate to or take something from, then, it, then that pleases me. You guys have all been lucky to also work on, besides the Scream franchise, other popular franchises, Ski with Law and Order, you mentioned CSI, New York, and to do that, Roger, Powerpuff Girls, right? <laughs> Nev, you got a lot of acclaim from Batman just this past year, you know? Is there an established brand that maybe you guys would want to appear in or on, Nev? If given the chance, even if it's just a guest shot? Oh my goodness. Um. I wouldn't be too proud of this technological terror you constructed. The power to destroy your planet is insignificant compared to the power of the Force. <laughs> so that's enough. <laughs> I, you know, to be honest, I'm so happy to be on House of Cards right now. That probably would have been on my list of these, this answer. So I feel, you know, really grateful to be a part of it. Stay away from the subway cars. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd really like to do Naked and Afraid. <laughs> that show was the most terrifying thing that ever uh, happened. Right. <laughs> do you actually think you could do it? I'd like to see if I could. I think I could. <laughs> you could probably get that job. Yeah. I think if you called them, they'd be like, yeah, come back into the jungle. <laughs> Horrifying, that show. Uh, hi, okay, I had um, two questions for Nev. My first one is, out of all the screen movies that you did, did you have a favorite, and why was it your favorite? I'd have to say the first, um, just because it was the first, and it was such a magical experience, and it was the beginning of the Eats, and we all just had such a blast. Um, and it's just tight, that movie, you know? It just seems flawless to me. Um, but again, like I said, it was, a, it, was, it was fun. It was a great experience. And, and I had fun playing Sydney and 
fun with the cast, and I loved where we shot. It was beautiful. It was, I don't know, it was just something very um, moving about that experience for all of us. It was interesting. I, I remember it was the second last night of shooting, and we all probably had a little bit too much wine and had dinner together. Everybody, the cast, and the producers, and Wes, and some of the crew. And I remember we were just doing a toast, and then suddenly we were all inspired to just share how meaningful that experience was to each of us. Meaningful to our lives in some way, and, and meaningful to us in our career. And um, I don't think we even knew at that time. Well, we didn't. Uh, yeah, the first one. Next up. Hi, John. Hi. Oh, cool, John. You run the family. But, um, did you ever find him intimidating? Was he, um, uh, was less of a hit? Did you find it intimidating working with Wes Craig? Oh my gosh. I'm probably lucky that I hadn't seen his films yet. Um, <laughs> when we started, because I think if I had had a concept of who he was, I, I might have been more intimidated and maybe not as capable of doing the performance that I was able to do. Um, I got to learn the power of Wes by working with him, and I'm so grateful for that. You know? Yeah, I, I never felt intimidated because he's so warm and, and welcoming and, you know, and appreciative of everybody's abilities and what they bring to it. So he has, there's not an intimidating bone in his body. So um, uh, I've never felt anything but, uh, you know, loved around him. So, oh, sorry, go ahead, Roger. No, no, no. Nope. What he says. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because, uh, you know, the people that we've interviewed from the horror world and the great writers and the great directors and the people who you would think are dark and twisted people generally tend to be yeah, the sweetest, nicest, most normal people out there, which is why their imagination is so great. So, how many times at Halloween do trick-or-treaters show up dressed as a ghost space killer in your door? A lot. <laughs> Well, it always surprises them when I open the door. <laughs> and it's always great for me because I don't have to wear a costume. <laughs> you go, you're me! <laughs> yeah, we've, uh, we live up a hill, so we never have trick-or-treaters come to our door. Because, I don't know, they're too lazy or something. <laughs> But we go down into our neighborhood, and there's always there's always scream masks somewhere. And um, and yeah, when my kids were littler, they found it very funny that you know, hey, that my, that my dad was that guy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's, it's definitely still around. And I think Edvard Munch should be the proudest. You know? it was his sort of conception, the painting of that that mask and. That painting, so. Roger, did your friends call you all the time? Try to do your voice and you'd have to be like, you suck at this, dude. <laughs> Never. <laughs> did your friends pay you to call other people? <laughs> no, but whenever you go to a recording session or something, people go, what, what did you do my answering machine? <laughs> so I shouldn't ask you that? <laughs> <laughs> the last question. Yeah. No question? Hi, I'm Jess. Uh, the year that Scream came out, I was uh, eight years old, and my slightly irresponsible babysitter at the time let me watch it. <laughs> so I remember going out for Halloween that year with my dad, and I think I made it four houses before I saw about 12 ghost faces, and then I had to go home. Uh, but I guess my question is, uh, was there ever a time when you were filming uh, any of the movies that you uh, just felt like you needed to take a break because it was just like too intense or too overwhelming because of all the the feelings that you had to draw from. Um, yeah, once in a, yeah, once in a while I need a moment just because it was exhausting. It was physically exhausting too, but um, emotionally it was 
That's what's another thing that was great about Wes is he was able to find, you know, for me it's about finding levels of fear to keep it interesting. Because it was all one note, it wasn't going to be that interesting to the audience. So, audience and so Wes was really good at mapping that out with me, which was wonderful. Um, but yeah, I think whenever you have to dig deep and go to frightening places or emotional places, we were just talking about this before actually, it can, it can be quite um, trying and I guess the challenge is getting home and being able to shed it and learning how to do that and letting, you know, because some people get so indulged in it, they don't know how to let it go or they feel that they have to keep it up for the entire film and I just, I can't even imagine because that would be exhausting. You know? Um, hi. I have never actually seen the movie before, or I don't know Welcome. anything about it. Um, can you give me a short story of it? <laughs> Adorable. <laughs> That's hilarious. She wants a plot That's a question for Roger. There's butterflies and unicorns. <laughs> and everybody lives happily ever after. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Ice cream. <laughs> All the characters at our farm in upstate New York where you can just run and run and run. Maybe just get a little bit older yeah, and then watch it. Oh, now yeah, this is older. Invincible and these two are bad men. <laughs> um, I'm her dad. So for her, <laughs> so for her sake, for, for the punching scene at the end with uh, Matt Miller, how did you prep for that, or did you? Because I picture if I were like that scene, how to, I just end up screwing around the whole time. Oh, the steps. Yeah, no, the punching scene. The punching scene. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> did you have to like prepare for it, <laughs> or you're like, bro, let's do this, and just went at it? Uh, no, you definitely have to prepare for it. Um, it's, you know, I mean, it's kind of the culmination of all a, a life of angst. And so, you know, you start poking around at yourself and, you know, what the, what makes, you know, what made me feel that way. What So, I, you know, I remember just sort of sitting alone, like, on the stairs outside the kitchen or somewhere, just somewhere private to, like, kind of get worked up and then just you kind of get to that spot and forget it and go have fun um, which is ultimately what it all is anyway so but you want to you know it definitely takes some some uh, you know preparation thank you next up Sorry, I just got off stage my father-daughter team so <laughs> <laughs> I haven't spoken yet uh, my first question is to Nev. Uh, I had the great pleasure of having your father as a drama teacher in high school, and seeing your successful and all, uh, did he give you any big piece of advice that just stuck? Don't act no. <laughs> you know, I, I learned so much from just watching my dad. Actually, were you, which school were you at? Uh, Lauren Park. Yeah, Lauren Park. I, well, I used to come um, to the school when he would do the musicals every other year, and I even choreographed one one year um, when I was like 12 or something like that. So just sitting next to him and watching him direct and listening to his advice to the students was very helpful for me. And then my mother also owned a dinner theater, and um, she was an amateur actress, so I, I watched her <laughs> perform, and my, young, my older brother acted before I decided to act him. So, so I was just observing my family, really. So I don't know if there was any one piece of advice, but I learned a lot from just watching. Hi. Um, the film was really advertised as Scream with Drew Barrymore. <laughs> Did you ever think that you were going to actually make the movie with Drew Barrymore? <laughs> no, because we read the script. <laughs> Um, but I was definitely excited to be a part of something that Drew is doing. Hey, how's it going? I'm uh, John with uh, Bloodbath and Beyond. And uh, my question is for you guys. In horror, you have your iconic slashers. Did you ever think that Ghostface would become an iconic slasher that he is now? Uh, 
Uh, I, no, I don't, I mean, again, I don't think any of us sort of expected, you know, I, I don't think you could go into, unless something's already established, like a house of cards or something, but something new that's just being created. Um, nobody really enters it thinking, oh, this is gonna be massive. Because the business is so fickle and audiences can turn their nose up to something you think is gonna be the biggest thing ever. And they can love something that you think, well, I don't know if this one will do that well. So, you know, really, I, 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 well, I think I speak for you know all of us. You, you kind of just go in to do your work and whatever happens, happens. And um, But no, there was no way to ever fathom that Ghostface would become you know, a legendary horror figure, uh, or certainly, you know, to this level. Um, there was no way to know. If Ghostface is iconic and the film is a legend, it's because of you, not us. Yeah, good point.